we can start. Okay, just give me 20 seconds and we'll start. Okay. Uh, very good morning to all of you. And uh, I've been asked to give two talks on astrophysical jets and supermassive black holes. You've had a reasonable de degree of exposure to jets uh, as well as the black holes. Uh, so my job would be to try and uh, recap some of what you have learned and also try and tie these things together in terms of understanding uh, the phenomenon of active galaxies or active galactic nuclei, where both astrophysical jets and supermassive black holes play a very important and seminal role. Now, before we proceed further, given your exposure uh, to astrophysical jets and also to supermassive black holes, uh, how would you define a jet? What would you, anybody can actually, can either put it in the chat or you can unmute and uh, say, what would you, what would you, how do you define a jet? What, what would be the characteristics of it? Any astrophysical jet. An astrophysical jet can occur in a wide variety of situations, right from uh, pulsar wind nebulae to active galactic nuclei to uh, uh, protostars which form. Uh, some of you, some of it you have been exposed to. So how do you, how would you distinguish, how would you describe a jet? Anybody? Feel free to unmute yourself. Rather than me speaking, it is nice to have an interactive discussions as we proceed forwards. Yeah, we can say it is a very fast moving uh, matter uh, through a very small cross section. So, uh, small cross section. Yeah, okay. Uh, basically, it's correct. Uh, but the thing is that you may not always have evidence of motion. Um, sometimes you can, sometimes you may not. So sometimes you may have to infer it from, uh, from the structure itself, which you say narrow cross-section, which is excellent. And, but we shall see that in, in many cases, you can actually measure motion. And to measure motion, there are two ways you'd be, you'd be able to do that. One is if you can identify a compact component and monitor its position from you know year to year, depending upon how fast it is moving. Um, okay, uh, and we will see how that also you know plays an important role. And the other way is that if you had spectral lines uh, from the jet, then you'd be able to monitor the measure the velocity at which the jet is moving out. But as we shall see in astrophysical jets, the emission is almost entirely. Uh, entirely continuum emission. So in continuum emission, uh, where it is broadband, if there isn't a spectral line, you would have to rely on measuring the motion of compact components. And the motion, because the objects are very far away, the apparent motion on the sky would be very small. So you need very high angular resolutions to be able to identify the compact components and then monitor its motion from year to year and find out how it is moving. Now, to just go back to a little bit of history, that astrophysical jets were recognized, uh, or at least the feature was recognized way back in 1918 uh, by Curtis. Uh, this was looking at the famous galaxy called Messier 87. Uh, Messier, as many of you may know, uh, was interested in comets, and he made a catalog of objects which were which uh, which could be confused with comets, but he didn't want these objects to we confused with comets, and so he made a catalog of these objects. And they are some of the most beautiful objects in the sky, relatively nearby because they have large angular sizes. They range from, you know, from nebulae in our galaxy to nearby galaxies, clusters of stars. And, uh, and this particular galaxy is called M87, Messier 87, which is a prominent elliptical galaxy in the Virgo cluster of galaxies. And Curtis, way back in 1918, noted that a curious straight ray lies in a gap in a nebulosity, apparently connected with a nucleus by a thin line of matter. This is what uh, Sobrito was mentioning about a small cross section. The ray is brightest at its inner end, which is 11 arc second from the nucleus. 
So although the significance of it was not recognized in those early days, this was the first attempt, our first uh, identification of what we call uh, jets today or astrophysical jets. And you can see it is over 100 years old. This was taken a step further many decades later by Baden Minkowski, who actually noted that several strong condensations are there in the outer parts of the jet, which extends about 20 arc seconds from the nucleus and has an average width of about two arc seconds. But what they measured was they measured the spectrum and which is shifted relative to the nuclear G type spectrum by minus 295 kilometers per second. And they were the first to use the word jet, actually. The jet was formed by ejection from the nucleus and that the O2 line is emitted by a part of the material which forms the jet and is still very close to, if not still inside the nucleus. So here you can see that by, they used the word term jet. They actually measured a blue ship minus 295 kilometers per second with the material coming towards us. But in these early days when Bard and Minkowski made these observations, we did not have much of an idea of jet formation. What does it consist of? What is the physical state? And, and by, by the time 1954, M87 was also one of the very strong radio sources, which was identified. Radio astronomy started off, as many of you may know, with the discovery by Carl Jansky of radio emission from the center of our galaxy. This was reported in a meeting of radio engineers RC meeting in April 1933 and heralded the opening of another window, a major window of the electromagnetic spectrum besides the optical window. So these are the two major windows we can observe from the Earth. For all the other regions of the electromagnetic spectrum, we have to go outside our atmosphere because the atmosphere absorbs the radiation which comes from the celestial sources at these wavelengths except at the optical and at the radio region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So now we come to the word of the used jet, which as uh, Subhita mentioned was fast moving material with narrow cross section. The next major discovery in active galactic nuclei was the discovery of quasars. Uh, I'll not digress too much into the history of discovery of quasars because we are limited by time, but these are extremely luminous objects and these are believed to be galaxies, not believed to be. There's observational evidence to suggest that these are nothing but galaxies with abnormally luminous nuclei. But when they were first discovered, they looked star-like in the Palomar Observatory Sky Survey prints, which were widely used at the time. And that is how it got its name of quasi-stellar objects. They, when they found these objects, they also noted a star of about 13 magnitude and a faint wisp or jet. And again, it was not visible within 11 arc seconds from the star and ends abruptly at about 20 arc seconds from the star. The close correlation between the radio structure and the star with the jet is suggestive and intriguing. So these were the very early days when we were beginning to recognize the, the active galactic nuclei, the kind of luminosities that they can emit. And the radio structure of the quasar was, was determined by Cyril Hazard and his collaborators using the technique of lunar occultation because uh, at that time, radio astronomical observations were largely at long wavelengths. And as you know, the resolution is given by lambda by D roughly, the Rayleigh criterion. And with the wavelengths being long, the radio resolutions were, rather, were rather poor compared by today's standards. And it was not possible to really determine the detailed structure of 3C273, or even confirm unambiguously that it is associated with the object. If one were to make single dish observations or observations by regular observations with a, with a regular antenna. So what Cyril Hazard and his collaborators did was, McKay and Shimmins was to, was to note that, the, that this radio source was getting occulted by the moon. So they knew the position of the moon accurately. And from the diffraction pattern, they could observe or infer uh, the, the, the position as well as the accurate position, as well as the structure of the quasar, the radio structure of the quasar. And this unambiguously identified the object with the star-like object whose redshift 
was measured by Martin Schmidt, which showed that it was a redshift of 0.158, which is puny small by today's standards, but it was part-breaking at the time, which put it at a luminosity distance of about 760 megaparsecs, making it one of the most luminous objects in the sky. And many wondered whether redshifts are indicative of distance, um, but today we, I think there is universal, almost universal agreement that the redshift is an indicator of distance. And we need to understand how these huge amounts of energy are generated and, and squirts out in the form of narrow collimated jets. And this is where the story of astrophysical jets and supermassive black holes get tied together. Now, this is an image of the first object which I showed you, uh, Messier 87, M87. Okay, uh, what, what this picture on the left shows you are radio images with very different resolutions and an optical image with a Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, optical telescope, Hubble Space Telescope is here. And this is a radio image made with a very large array. And this is a radio image with much higher resolution made with a very long baseline array. Now, what you can see over here is the radio jet more clearly. What we had seen so far were the early images of the optical jet. And this is a much higher resolution uh, image of the jet made, made with the Hubble Space Telescope. With, over here in this particular jet, one has been able to infer motion by looking at the motion of the knots of emission in the jet. Uh, this has been done um, extensively at radio wavelengths but you can see the knots are very clearly identifiable and one could do it at the optical as well. Now, uh, what you notice over here is that the scale is also given. This is 4,000 light years. Then you zoom in, you get 2,000 light years, just the jet itself. And then the nucleus over here, which shows a core and a jet, initially with a large opening angle, which seems to collimate. And you can see this collimated structure, both at radio and optical wavelengths. What you also notice over here is that when you observe it with high resolution, you miss the large scale structure. Okay, And that has to do with the way uh, interferometers are sensitive to different components or Fourier components of the brightness distribution of the source. When you have antennas which are very far away and, and, uh, and observe a radio source in the sky or observe any source in the sky, different wavelengths, optical interferometry is also widely used these days, that when the antennas are far away, then the angular resolution is given by lambda by the separation of the antennas, not the size of a single antenna, but the separation of the antennas. So when you have large separations, then you're, you become insensitive to this you know, large scale structure for which you need small separations. So astronomers try to combine uh, observations with different spacings to construct images with, uh, with information on different scales. But often when you make VLB observations, it is difficult to try and detect the larger scale structure. Now, all of you would have seen about the, about the uh, results of the Event Horizon Telescope. You can see this is 0.1 light years, and this is 0.00. 0 0.011 light years, which is the diameter of the ring. And, and when you observe with much higher resolution, you see this shadow or the material in the vicinity of the black hole and a ring and a darker ring within it, which is, which is within, within which the black hole resides. So these are all images of the galaxy M87. I'll just show you one more image of it. Okay. And this actually shows you the images, the high resolution images at, uh, at VLBI resolutions. And this, this shows you the jet. There is a prominent knot over here, which is probably due to shock in the flow of the jet created by, you know, material which, which is, which is uh, squirting out from the nucleus, but catches up with material which is emitted earlier. And you can see this is ALMA, which is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. And you can see a lot of these observations are at uh, millimeter wavelengths. Why millimeter wavelengths? Because if you want to look at the small scale structure, you need high resolution. And if you recollect, um, 
a Rayleigh's criteria of angular resolution being lambda by d, then when you go to smaller lambda, okay, smaller lambda, which means higher frequencies, then you will get a higher resolution. And that is why the event horizon telescope, which you can see, has a resolution of 50 micro arc seconds, roughly, is what is given over here. Uh, and you can see it's, it operates at a wavelength of 1.3 millimeters. This is the global millimeter VLP array, 3.5 millimeters. This is a very long base time array, 7 millimeters. And you can see that it, it actually, uh, what you, the resolution which you get, one is the wavelength, the other is the separation of the antennas, lambda upon the separation of the antennas. And the Event Horizon Telescope had antennas right from the South Pole to Hawaii. So you, can, you had the largest separations, the highest frequencies, smallest wavelength, and that is what enabled the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration to image the black hole. And they have since reported results on the polarization properties of M87 and also results from uh, Centaurus A, another nearby radio galaxy, our own center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, which also has about uh, a few solar mass, a uh, few million solar mass black holes sitting in the center of it. But our understanding of jets would be incomplete if we were to confine ourselves to only the radio or the optical part of the electromagnetic spectrum, because different physical processes uh, play a role in the emission which you see at different wavelengths. So what you see over here are poorer resolution observations, okay, but uh, with at higher energies. Uh, this is with the Swift telescope. Then this is with the Chandra telescope at X-ray wavelengths. This is again with New Star at X-ray wavelengths. Then this is even higher energies with the S gamma ray wave, gamma rays uh, G hundred GeV to ten TeV. Then you can see the Fermi telescope as well. Which so we need information at all kinds of wavelengths and at different resolutions as well to try and construct our complete understanding or as complete as it can be of uh, the central supermassive black holes and the jets which are associated with them, okay? Now, th this is a Quasar 3C273, which I pointed out earlier, which was discovered by Cyril Hazard and his collaborators from the Radio Image and Martin Schmidt, who determined the optical spectrum. Initially, they were puzzled by the, by the look of the optical spectrum, till Martin Schmidt, in a mo moment of brilliance, noticed that it was nothing but the red-shifted Balmer spectrum that he was seeing. But these are images of the jet in the quasar 3C273, which is the first quasar to be identified, uh, radio wavelengths at optical wavelengths and at X-ray wavelengths. You can see that although there are similarities, there are also differences. And these differences arise due to the different physical processes or radi radiative processes, acceleration processes, which occur or which dominate at the different wavelengths. So we will try and look at a brief uh, sort of overview of it without getting into too much of detail. Now, I will talk a little bit about radio galaxies and quasars, but before that, let me ask you, um, have you keep using the term supermassive black holes? So what do you think is the range of masses of supermassive black holes? What would I call when would they call a black hole as a supermassive black hole? Any one of you can unmute and share your thoughts. What, what do you think is a supermassive black hole? Yesterday, Ranjeev talked to you about X-ray binaries. Are those supermassive black holes? You can put it in the chat box also, or you can you can unmute yourself and speak. Okay, Nankuman Chakrabarti says billion solar masses. Okay. Okay, billion solar masses would fall in it, but but the range, I want a little bit more on the range of uh, what I would call a supermassive black hole. Thousand to billion solar masses, Anudeep says. Okay, any other answers? You can unmute or put in the chat, whatever is convenient.
No more answers? Okay. No, the thing is that the range is rather wide. Okay. Um, a thousand, I mean, for a long time, we knew about stellar mass black holes, right? Which are, which are, uh, um, which are there in the X-ray binaries, which uh, Ranjeev talked to you about yesterday. And we also knew about the supermassive black holes, which, uh, which Gulab would have talked, have talked, Gulab has talked to you earlier, and which we will deal with in these two sets of lectures. But when we talk about supermassive black holes, we talk about roughly about a million. Some uh, some authors also try to consider a hundred thousand uh, solar masses as a supermassive black hole, and extends it extends to a billion solar masses. But roughly to about a hundred thousand or a million to several billion solar masses would be a supermassive black hole. A thousand solar masses are what are known as intermediate mass black holes. So you have stellar mass black holes, then. Um, you have intermediate mass black holes, then you have supermassive black holes. And we did not have very firm evidence of intermediate mass black holes uh, till, till recent times, actually. In fact, the gravitational wave uh, merger uh, gave, us, um, gave us an intermediate mass black hole that was over uh, about 150 solar masses or so. But we have also found evidences of, uh, you know, of, of more massive uh, black holes since then. And so from about, say, you know, 100 solar masses or thereabouts to about uh, 100,000 solar masses is what we would call intermediate solar mass, intermediate uh, mass black holes. Uh, below that would be the stellar mass black holes. And many of them are in the range of, you know, a few to ten, tens of tens of solar masses, where the supermassive black holes are ones from about 100,000 to several billion solar masses. And as we go today and tomorrow, we will also learn how, why this, this, having this large mass is extremely important in terms of the energy that is generated and, and the collimation of jets and the energy that is generated and transported over very large distances of megaparsec scale distances or so. Now let me just try and illustrate to you. This is something which you may have done with, uh, done with uh, my friend Gulab, but let's just quickly revise it. Okay. Now radio galaxies are a class of active galactic nuclei, just like quasars, and they were also discovered by trying to find optical counterparts of radio sources. Uh, when radio astronomy took off after the discovery of Karl Chansky, uh, particularly after the Second World War, when a lot of radar engineers who had taken part in the war effort turned to radio astronomy. Uh, and, and we began to make images of the sky, surveys of the sky, and later images or more detailed images of the, of the objects. Uh, the natural thing to do was to try and find out what these radio sources in the sky are. And the most natural thing was to try and find if they're associated with optical objects. And, and among the nearby galaxy, the first ones, initial ones to be identified were Virgo A, Centaurus A, Fornix A, Hercules A, and Cygnus A with, with galaxies, all right? And once you knew, once you could associate with the galaxy, uh, the discoveries were that uh, the, the lobes of radio emission, the radio emission is not coincident with the galaxy, but appeared on opposite sides of it. And more detailed images much, much later, because initially one only saw the two lobes of emission and the optical galaxy in between, that one be began to discern the jets of plasma. Sometimes they were much stronger, sometimes they were weaker. And we will see why some are stronger and some are weaker as we go along and in these two sets of lectures. But what you can see in this object is one of the early ones which are identified, Cygnus A, which is in the constellation Cygnus, it's at a redshift of 0 0.056, which corresponds to luminosity distance of 250 megaparsec. And it is associated with a very dusty, but large elliptical galaxy. And that is why you, you can see all these dark spots in the optical image. And you can see a faint jet, and there is also a weak counter jet over here. And what you see over here are these bright hotspots at the outer edges, which are identified with a the regions where the jets interact with the external environment and deposits most of its energy. 
The store, all sources start out small. When the jets are generated by the supermassive black hole, the jets travels outwards, initially traveling through the interstellar medium of the host galaxy, and then through the general intercluster or intergroup medium, and then the general intergalactic medium. So it's like a jet uh, snow plowing its way through the external environment. And the region where it interacts is where it deposits a lot of its energy, forming the hotspots. And, and the electrons or radiating particles then travel backwards, uh, forming these lobes of emission. And these, these hotspots are moving usually at supersonic velocities, several Mach numbers, which generates a bow shock at the outer edges. Okay. Now, I want you to remember this structure because I want you to distinguish it from another kind of source, which I've shown over here, Herculese. Herculese, also you can see, this was again one of the very early sources to be identified. Uh, 0.155 is redshift corresponding to luminosity distance of 745 megaparsec. So just to remind those who may not be familiar with the parsec the nomenclature, one parsec is about 3.26 light years. Light year, as you know, the distance travels by light in a year. So 745 million parsecs. So you multiply by 3.26 to get the distance in light, uh, to get the distance in light years. What you see over here are diffuse plumes of emission. Plumes of emission. There is no well-defined hotspot which you saw in the outer edges. And you see jets which are more symmetric. And you also see as though there were different cycles of activity over here. You can see this as though somebody is blowing like a smoke bubbles of somebody who smokes or, and, and, and the jet activity may be episodic. That is, it's, it shoots out jet, stops for a while, shoots out again. So this is another interesting area which has really come up in the last decade of why these jets actually are episodic and what are the conditions that determine. Without getting into that detail, I just want you to realize these two broad classes of objects because we'll keep coming back to that later. Uh, one is where there are prominent hotspots at the outer edges. The jets are much more collimated. Uh, they are narrow. They're generally weaker and they're more asymmetric. Here, they are, there are no diffuse, there are no hotspots at the outer edges. What you see are diffuse plumes of emission. The jets are more symmetric on large scales. Although if you observe it with high resolution, you will also see asymmetric jets in the nucleus. But on large scales, they are more symmetric and, and often are not as well collimated as in these high luminosity sources. Now, these two categories of objects was first recognized by Bernie Fanerov, who is now one of the leading lights in South Africa, who, who was instrumental in getting the square kilometer array or one component of it in South Africa, and Julia Riley, with whom he worked as a graduate student in Cambridge. And these two categories are referred to as Fanerov Riley class one and Fanerov Riley class two. Right? So just remember that class one objects have no hotspots, more symmetric jets on large scales, and, and less well collimated than the ones in FR2 sources. FR2 sources are more luminous, are, have prominent hotspots at the outer edges, um, have better collimated jets, and the jets are asymmetric, um, often one-sided on even large scales, unlike the FR1 sources. We'll try to understand how these differences arise without getting into too much of detailed mathematics because we don't have the time for it. But I would like you to remember these two classes of objects. There are suggestions that these two classes may also be related to the different accretion processes, but we will try and discuss that a bit when we come to accretion being the source of energy for these active, uh, for these radio galaxies. I've just shown you images of giant radio galaxies, which are defined to be greater than about 0.7 megaparsecs. That is 700 kiloparsecs. That means over about 2200 light years or so. Okay, about approximately. Sorry, 2200 million light years. Okay. Uh, now, if you look at uh, if you look at uh, 
these objects, these are, I wanted to show you a few GMRT images. And this was uh, uh, made by us. This was, this was the largest radio galaxy, galaxy which was known with a size of about 4.7 megaparsec. Uh, till very recently, till a few months ago, it was the largest. But the European uh, array, the low far low frequency array, has discovered one which is slightly larger than this. And so this is now the second largest uh, a giant radio galaxy, which was discovered with the JMRT as well as Effelsberg and VLA observations put together. VLA is a very large array. And JMRT is a giant meter wave radio telescope, which is on the outskirts of Pune, built by the National Center for Radio Astrophysics of TIFR, as many of you may know. This is an example of a jet, which may be actually processing. This is, again, a giant radio galaxy, which uh, Pratik Dabadi has uh, imaged using both low far, the low frequency array, and a giant meter wave radio telescope. And you can see these jets are symmetric, squirting out in different directions, no prominent hotspots at the outer edges. And these structures are possibly due to, uh, symmetric structures on opposite sides are possibly due to the ejection axis itself processing. And this is a very classic example of a jet. The core actually sits right in the middle, the nucleus from where the jets originate. And this image was made by Chiranjit Konar, who is now at MIT University um, in, uh, in Noida. And you can see two distinct pairs of lobes, which shows that uh, the central engine, which generates the jets, switched off and switched back again. And these are some of the examples of radio galaxies with jets, which I wanted to highlight to you. Now, uh, before I get into jets in less luminous galaxies and aspects of mm -hmm. less luminous galaxies and black holes in them, uh, I will stop for a few minutes, a couple of minutes, for you to ask me any questions or discuss anything which we have covered so far. Right? Any questions so far? Debakar Dutta has raised your hand. Go ahead. Can you unmute yourself? Please go ahead. Yes. Hello. 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 Uh, hello. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, audible. Yeah, audible. Yeah. So my question is that uh, how are these uh, pictures? I mean, the, uh, this this is done by the radio astronomy, and yes. uh, in, uh, they are uh, coming in the radio wave. So those are yes. not in the visible region. Yes. And what uh, yes. when they are actually so you have to map them uh, in the optical region. So. Uh, the, my question is that I have seen uh, several photos also in the previous one. So how these things are mapped? I mean, uh, you have uh, radio waves as well as the optical waves also because uh, I've seen the galaxies on the or, or the stars uh, on the background. So uh, that was my question. So how these things, I mean, the jets are coming uh, in the radio waves. So I can understand. But okay. how are these things mapped in a single picture? That was my question. Sir. Okay, okay. <laughs> that's, that's very straightforward. Actually, what happens is that when you observe with a radio telescope, you're only going to detect uh, radio emission. You're only going to detect uh, signals from the uh, radio part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Your telescope, which you're you using, will be tuned to a particular frequency or frequency range, and you'll be making your observations at the radio part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, if I want to find out the environment of the source with what optical galaxy it is associated with, with or, or if I want to look at where the X-ray emission lies relative to radio emission, then I will need an image of the same part of the sky, exactly the same part of the sky, at the different wavelengths which I want to sort of use to make a detailed study of the object. So in this particular object, what you see in the background is an optical image. So the optical image has been obtained by an optical telescope and the radio image has been obtained by a radio telescope. In this particular case, it was a very large image. So then what you do is that you have to superpose one on the other, the two images, you've got to combine it together uh, to form a single image, all right? So that uh, with ensuring that your positions are absolutely accurate. That means the, the position of any point in the sky in a radio image should match exactly with the, uh, op with the position in the optical image. So it's by superposing and combining these images that this particular uh, image has been constructed. In the lower image, you can see that 
And that is not the case. That is only a radio image. So, uh, so in the lower image, the, uh, the superposition with an optical image or an image at other wavelengths has not been done. But you will find that uh, in very often, even in the optical window, for example, I may want to look at the look at the H alpha gas and the oxygen three gas. How is it related in a particular object? How is it distributed? So even over there, I may use different colors to denote uh, the the O three emission and the H alpha emission, for example. And as you as you pointed out, that radio is not something which you can see with our eyes. So in radio images, whatever colors you see are false colors. And optical images also, for example, when you observe with a CCD, a CCD, you know, is, you know, electrons get excited by the photons which are coming in. The electrons don't have a color. So these are reconstructions which are done later on by uh, processing the images that you get or the data that you get at different wavelengths. Okay. So, so these are two different telescopes, two different images, and they have been combined together to give you this image. Is it all right? Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Okay. Any other thank questions you. that we didn't leave you there? There's some one more question. Uh, thank see. you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, any other question? Okay, there is something new on the chat if you see. How uh, Anudeep has asked uh, why jets have turned almost 90 degrees. Okay, one second. And, uh, okay, one second. Let me get. There's another question. How is the shape of the contours in the image decided? And is the noise in the radio observations more or less in the observations at other frequencies? Uh, why jets have turned almost 90 degrees in 3C293? There's none Kumar Chakrita. Okay, so let me let me sort of uh, address both these questions uh, to, uh, together. All right. Then, okay, let me try and... Uh, sorry, one sec. Let me go ahead and look at the, look at the control map and to answer. The first question, and then we'll say why jets have turned. Okay. Now, for example, what you measure, okay, what you measure are, for example, if I take a radio image, just like a, uh, just like an optical uh, CCD image, that I can divide this whole image up into uh, into into pixels. That is the way I would actually um, do it while trying to make the image from the in, from the from the data which I get, and then I would. Uh, Try to draw the contours by uh, drawing contours of equal brightness or intensity. Okay, and uh, you may have to extrapolate between pixels. That's fine. So this is just intensities of uh, contours of similar intensity or brightness. You can represent it as contours, or you can represent it as colors. That's that's your choice, depending upon uh, what your objective is, what you want to highlight. Now, how do you choose a minimum contour? Or how do you choose the cutoff? Usually what happens is that you want to try and estimate what is the noise in the map. Okay. Because in the in from pixel to pixel, there would be variations which is not the real signal. So you find out the RMS variations in intensity of brightness in a certain area of the sky where you don't have a radio source, and you try to point it at about three times the RMS noise or four times the RMS noise to make sure that what you're presenting is actually the signal from the source and not noise peaks. If the quality of your image is not good, then you will see artifacts of the, of, in the image at about the three sigma level. On the other hand, if your image is good, then what you will see is just noise and, uh, and you will see the real image without any noise uh, coming into it. All right. Now, uh, there's some more questions which will come to in a short while. Now, for example, Nan Chakradari asked, why does a jet bend? Why does a jet bend by 90 degrees? Jet can bend for a, for a number of reasons. One is you're transporting a fluid, relativistic fluid over large distances. So instabilities can arise, uh, such as the kelvin elmos instabilities, which, which is due to the motion, relative motion of two fluids. Then you can have um, oscillations in the flow of the jet, which you which you will see as bends in the jet. Uh, there could be precession of the jet axis, as I mentioned in this case, in which you will see bends in the jet. Then you may find a jet which is ramming into a cloud of gas, so that by interacting with the cloud, it may bend by a certain degree, depending upon the physics or the details of the interaction with the cloud. 
So as you can see, that there are a number of ways in which the jets may, uh, may jets may not be completely linear, but actually uh, show interesting structures. Uh, I will also show you an image later of how the parent galaxy, so far what I've shown you, we have assumed it to be stationary, but it need not be stationary. It could be moving in the general intercluster medium. The galaxy itself may be moving uh, as it is spewing out jets in opposite directions. Then you will get all kinds of interesting C-shaped structures um, or you know, structures because the, the jets have been bent backwards by the intercluster medium. So the dynamics of a, of a cluster are complex and interaction of the radio jets with the cluster with the cluster medium can also give rise to all kinds of interesting structures. So there are a number, there are various ways in which jets may not be collinear, but express, but, um, but exhibit all kinds of bends and interesting structures, which one needs to study and understand and interpret. Okay, Shlok, you have your hands up. Uh, sir, uh, I have a very general question. Yeah, uh, uh, can we have isolated quasars, like uh, something which are not a part of the center of a galaxy? Not the part of a center of our galaxy. Okay. Now, yeah. the thing is that when galaxies were, when quasars were first discovered, they looked completely point-like on the sky, and that is how it got its name of quasi-stellar object. Now, the question then arose that what is the nature of these objects? And the early speculation was that they may be uh, abnormally luminous nuclei associated with galaxies. All right. Now, then people started looking for these galaxies. There were suggestions of such galaxies existing for some of the nearby quasars, which were looked at uh, from ground based telescopes. But on the other hand, uh, you know, because from ground based you're seeing limited or even, you know, and also your dynamic range limited. Uh, and these made it difficult to look at uh, any surrounding galaxy around it because the central nucleus was extremely bright. It is similar like to when you see the sun, you don't see the stars around the stars in the sky. Uh, so it took the Hubble Space Telescope actually to, to demonstrate that almost every quasar, uh, almost every quasar uh, where you expect to see the fuzz around it of a galaxy, that they were able to detect it. Initially, actually, with the Hubble Space Telescope also, they made, in the initial data reduction, they made a mistake and thought that they were lone quasars, but uh, or naked quasars, as they called it. But later, when the when more careful data reduction was done, that um, that almost all galaxies where you expected to see, almost all quasars where you expected to see a galaxy, they actually saw one. So the question is that, uh, I mean, they're clearly uh, nuclei, or abnormally luminous energy is being generated. And it is it is not unnatural for them to be residing in galaxies. So unless somebody clearly demonstrates that there is such an object without any galaxy around it, uh, one, would, one would tend to sort of uh, go in the direction that quasars are nothing but the galaxies with abnormally luminous nuclei. Okay? Thank you, sir. Uh, Shubhadeep, you had a question? And this is the last question, then we will move on to the next section. All right? Yeah, hello, sir. Go ahead, Swadeep. Yeah. Sir, nowadays we know how stellar mass black hole or intermediate black holes are formed. Is yeah. the physics the same for the formation of uh, supermassive black hole? Actually, supermassive black, black hole formation is a big topic of research. All right. And we, today we know from even the gravitational wave detections that galaxies, that black holes merge. So the question is uh, how did they form? And they seem to have formed in the very early epochs of the universe because we have active galactic nuclei uh, in the very early stages, in the early stages of when structures formed and galaxies formed. And we know of radio galaxies, luminous radio galaxies at large redshifts. So these supermassive black holes should have formed very early on in the evolution of the universe. A detailed understanding, I mean, mergers of smaller black holes is a possibility. Uh, to form these supermassive black holes, but the details of how we form these supermassive black holes is still an area of active research. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. So we will try and look at one more, one or two more aspects today. Uh, we'll close before one o'clock so that you have time. So I, rather than keep your questions in the end, 
even when I'm speaking, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand, okay? It's better to be interactive because if you ask questions, I also learn and the others also learn. Okay? So don't hesitate to ask questions in the middle also. Now, we have so far talked about radio galaxies and quasars. And there was another class of, radio gal of active galaxies which were discovered well before uh, radio galaxies and quasars were discovered. And these are ciphered galaxies. And as we, uh, uh, very early in the 20th century, 1908, Path at a Lick Observatory took a spectrum of a spiral galaxy. Uh, and he noted that they were, uh, it had an emission line spectrum. Now, as you know from your studies of stars, which Dipanka talked to you about, the stellar spectra are dominated by absorption lines, right? So if you took just a normal galaxy like our own or the Andromeda Nebula, then that galaxy, that spectrum would be dominated by absorption lines, which is due to the absorption lines of stars. Now, when you see an emission line, it, it's a curiosity as to why you have prominent emission lines in this galaxy. Many years later, Slipher at Lowell Observatory uh, measured made more measurements and showed that emission lines were similar to planetary nebulae. Planetary nebulae are ones which where stars in the later stages of the revolution shed their outer envelopes. These are hot gas and they emitted em emission lines. And lines had widths of hundreds of kilometers per second. And when it was left to Carl Seifert, after whom this category of galaxies is named, he drew attention to a number of such galaxies with they had semi-stellar or point-like nuclei, which are more clearly visible in short exposure photographs because they're very bright. And if, uh, if you have long exposures, it just burns out. But you can see the stellar or semi-stellar nuclei in short exposure photographs. And they had very prominent emission lines. Okay, Unlike the majority of normal galaxies. Just to show you what a spectrum of a normal galaxy might look like, this is uh, this is a um, um, an image which I picked up from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, it's a red galaxy in a cluster. And you can see that it is dominated by absorption lines. Okay, And this will be similar to, for example, if you took a spectrum of Andromeda Nebula or, or some of the nearby galaxies which don't have luminous nuclei, you will get a similar spectrum. This is what we call a normal galaxy. Okay, This is what Seifert found. That you can see it's a very different spectrum, right? It's a very dis different spectrum dominated by emission lines. But what you notice over here is also that some lines are narrow, some lines are pretty broad. Okay. For example, if you look at H alpha, you can see that it is pretty broad. There are narrow nitrogen two lines over here, which are quite a similar wavelength. But if I look at oxygen three, for example, okay, it is very narrow compared to H beta, where there is a narrow component, but there's also a very broad component, right? So, so, so what, what you find is that there is a category of galaxies called Seifert ones, where you see both broad lines as well as narrow lines. Okay, broad lines as well as narrow lines. And there is another category of galaxies, Seifert galaxies, which have any, anyways, against prominent emission lines, very different from the absorption line spectrum of a normal galaxy, which I showed you. But here you can see that H alpha which was quite broad in the earlier picture, but it is very narrow over here. Oxygen-3 is also narrow. So C4-2 galaxies have narrow emission lines, and these the widths are due to the motion of the line-emitting clouds, the upper motion of the line-emitting clouds, and the velocity, y, the width of the lines is due to the velocity of the line-emitting clouds. So you have galaxies where there are broad lines as well as narrow lines, and there are galaxies where there are only narrow lines. So when I have broad lines, I have clouds which are moving about very rapidly. When I have, when I can see only narrow clouds, that means the lines which I am seeing are all from clouds of line emitting gas, which are moving slowly. How slowly? Hundreds of kilometers per second. And then when they are moving fast, how fast? Thousands of kilometers per second. Could be up to 10,000 kilometers per second. Okay. Now, from your knowledge of physics, I want you to tell me under what circumstances would you see broad emitting, broad, large velocities of the clouds, and on what conditions are you going to see narrow velocities of the clouds? 
I've just summarized over here. Narrow lines with widths up to a few hundred kilometers per second and broad lines with radius with widths up to corresponding to velocities up to 10,000 kilometers per second. Cipher 2 only show prominent narrow lines and broad lines are weak or usually absent. Don't worry about the intermediate types for this, uh, for this uh, set of lectures. Now tell me, when do you expect to see large velocities and when do you expect to see small velocities? I want you to just connect to physics, which you know from your, you know, from physics, which you have done. Look at our own planetary system, for example. Any one of you can unmute or even, even put it in the chat also if you like. You're having problems unmuting. High energy, large velocities, okay, is what Devakar says, okay. Okay, there would be large kinetic energy for high velocities, that's okay. But uh, why, why do they have large velocities in the first place? High, low, Z. Z is redshift, okay? Z is, a, Z is what is used for, small Z is used for redshift. Capital Z is often used for metallicity. But they have high and low velocities, okay, but why? Okay, so Brita is saying large velocities mean close to the nucleus, okay? But what happens if it is close to the nucleus? Why should it have a large velocity if it is close to the nucleus? You can unmute and say also. Uh, uh, I'm not even, sir. Uh, Richik, yeah, you're audible. Go ahead. Uh, if, if the matter is uh, getting highly accelerated, it's a good sign. High force. Large force, some, some large force, uh, which is getting accelerated to very high velocities. Uh, so no, but I'm asking why? Why is the velocity large? I mean, uh, why is the velocity large? I mean, Subrata is in the right direction, saying large velocity is being close to the nucleus. But why should meaning close to the nucleus give you large velocities? I mean, if it is gravitating uh, to a very massive object, then close to the massive object means uh, large. Very good. very good. So it is basically the mass of the central object which governs it, right? So, but we'll we'll come to why we see differences between Cipher 1s and Cipher 2s, okay? Um, Cipher 2 galaxies in terms of the lines, but the broad line clouds would be closer to the nucleus and, and, uh, and you can understand it very easily from, you know, from the motion of our planets, actually, right? Because um, just Kepler's laws of motion, uh, uh, Pluto would be, I'm sorry, uh, Mercury and Venus would be uh, going around much faster around the sun than, say, uh, Jupiter or Saturn, right? Because V is proportional to 1 upon square root of R. So, so, so once you're closer to a massive object, you will be moving about much more rapidly. But it is not that a massive object is less massive in, in Cipher 2s compared to Cipher 1s. You should not jump at the conclusion that Cipher 2, there is no such massive object. Okay, We will see how to resolve this, but it is not due to the absence of a massive object. Okay? But before going to that, let me just also illustrate to you that jets are also present in these uh, Seaford galaxies, but they are much, much less luminous than that of the radio galaxies and quasars. Okay, radio galaxies and quasars. And here is an example of a well known Seaford galaxy, NGC 4151. And you can see these collimated jets. The nucleus is sitting within one of these prominent components, but you can see collimated structures, collimated uh, jet emission, just like as you see in radio galaxies and quasars but they are much smaller in size, okay? Here you can see I put the scale for NGC 4151 as one arc second is equal to 96 parsecs, okay? And one arc, this is two arc seconds, 20 arc seconds to 22 arc seconds. This is two arc seconds. This is slightly more than two arc seconds. So you can see it's about slightly over a couple of hundred parsecs or so. Whereas we have seen jets in luminous radio galaxies and quasars 
which extend to megaparsec, hundreds of kiloparsec, and the overall size is being on the megaparsec scale for the largest objects. Few megaparsec is what we just saw. And this axis seems to be related to some axis of the galaxy itself, because this is this what this colored blot shows you is the O3 to H alpha ratio. That means the ionized gas and level of ionization you measure. But you can see that this is related. It's not a spherical distribution. There is some axis which is not very far off from the, from the radio axis. And so there is some fundamental axis which seems to be occurring in these objects. Okay, Some of it may appear misaligned because of projection effects as well. Now let's uh, get down to what... Uh, what you all suggested a little while ago, that uh, 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 Subrata and Richik were closest to it, that, uh, that once you get to, to, uh, closer to a massive object, your velocity should be larger, okay? And, uh, and when it is further away, it will be smaller. So let us put these broad line reach in. Okay, this is the supermassive black hole which you see over here, okay? Where my cursor is, okay? which could be million solar masses or more. And, and you have, uh, you have uh, clouds of gas which are moving around it, right? Moving around it. And these galaxies will have, uh, these uh, line emitting clouds will have larger velocity, larger widths of the lines because they're moving about much more randomly, much more high velocities and randomly around the black hole. This region is referred to as a broad, broad line region. Okay? When you go further away from the nucleus, then the velocities begin to drop because you're moving further away from the massive object, which is governing its motion. And so when you go further away, you will see the narrow line regions. Okay, Narrow line regions. All right? When you go further away. And this can extend to kiloparsec scales. Whereas this, this is usually within the parsec scale of parsec scales. So it is close to the supermassive black hole, whereas the narrow lines are further away. Okay. Now, uh, just drawing on what you have said, now if I can get a direct view of the nuclear region, okay, then I will see the broad line regions. Okay. And I would get what is called a type one. Seifert, which will have broad lines from the lines which I can see close to the black hole, and the narrow lines which are further from it as well. So I'll get both the lines. Now, if for some reason this region is blocked from our view, which happens in the case of the Seifert two galaxies, then I will not see the broad lines. I will only see the narrow lines. So these are the type two objects with the narrow emission lines as seen. Sometimes you may see a weak broad emission line, but generally they're dominated by the narrow emission lines. That gives me a plausible scenario or picture, right? But I need to be able to test it. I need to be able to say, is that correct or not correct? Right? So let me try and convince you that it is a plausible picture from the observations that we have. Now, if we want to have this scenario, which is sort of the broad model is correct. There are more details which have been put in over the years. This is from a review which I had taken by Megari and Paul in 1995, quite a long time ago, but the broad picture is still okay. Now, I'm talking about Seifert, and they they put this in the radio quiet regime because the luminosity is much, much lower by orders of magnitude compared to radio galaxies and quasars, which are referred to as radio tau. Now, if this picture is correct, then this black hole will also give rise to photons. You've heard about the accretion disk. So there should be cones of ionized gas and not uniformly ionized all around it. Okay. Do I see evidence of this ionization cones? Let me first ask that question. And the answer is yes. I'll show you just one or two examples. This is a spiral galaxy, a simple galaxy, NGC 5728. And when you map the emission line gas, this is a continuum image. This is the HST view of the emission line gas. And you can clearly see cones of emission 
That means the photons are not going out in four pi star radians, but blocked by a torus kind of structure. A torus is effectively like a medovara kind of structure with a black hole sitting in the center of it. There would be asymmetries because, you know, depending upon how it is oriented, some parts of it get absorbed, etc. But you can see evidence of ionization codes. And this is not the only example. There are other examples as well. I've just shown you two examples of ionization cones saying that the central region, which has the black hole and the jets are roughly aligned with these ionization cones as well. And these ionization cone axis or the jet axis don't seem to have any relationship with the overall axis of the galaxy. Right? So a broad picture of there being an obstruction is probably okay, but we need to do a bit better than that. Okay. This is just another example of a torus kind of structure which has been mapped in the nuclear region in molecular hydrogen gas in another galaxy, NGC 4151. And again, you can see that the jet axis, which I showed you earlier, is really orthogonal to it, which is consistent with the model which I showed you earlier. This model. Okay. Now, but we want to do better than that. And how do we want to, how do we go about it? The question we are asking ourselves is that in a C4 to galaxy where I cannot see the broadline region, all right, which is due to the effect of a supermassive black hole, I want to know that there is a supermassive black hole and broadline emitting clouds over there. Although this torus or medivara kind of structure is obstructing my view. So how do you think you'll go about it? Just, just, just thoughts about just your thoughts about it. Can you share and and see how you might actually approach this problem? Any one of you can unmute or put it in the chat also. How would you go about it, sir? Can you please repeat the question. Sorry. Can you please repeat the question? Uh, I'll repeat the question. Okay. Now, what I'm saying is that in a Cifer 2 galaxy, okay, I cannot see the supermassive black hole. The jet is along this axis. I've seen it. I've seen an ionization cone over here of narrow emission lines. But I want to be sure that there are broad lines over here. I want to find out if there are broad lines over here. And if there are broad lines, there would also be a supermassive black hole because as as several of you pointed out that the large motions which give rise to large black hole, large widths of the emission lines is due to a supermassive object at the center. Now I want to find out that although this torus hides my point of my view of this region, is there a way I can actually go and have a peep into this region and find out that there are indeed line emitting clouds which have moving about very rapidly, giving rise to broad lines. Can I peep into that region? Let me put the question in another way. Suppose, suppose in, a, in an office, in a room, you had a, you had a partition between, you know, a partition, and you had a friend sitting at the other part of the room. And you're not able to partition is not entirely partitioned out, but half partition or or so. You want to find out whether your friend is there. How do you how do you do it? Of course, you could shout, and you'll shout back. But but if you were quiet, how would you do it? Debakar, go ahead. Light reflected from the disk, observe in X-rays. Okay, they're 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 both interesting suggestions, and they're both partially correct. Okay. Um, you would, you would uh, uh, partially correct. That is, Sinorita, um, uh, uh, Anubum, uh, and Nan Chakravati. Light not reflected from the disk itself, because you can see the structure of the disk that you see, it will probably not come to your line of sight. So you need something which is above, okay, which will reflect it to your line of sight, right? So for example, in this particular case, if you're observing from here, you need a mirror over here to be able to reflect this light and come here, okay? And X-rays, low energy X-rays would be absorbed, but 
um, but you you'd have learned from Gulab's talk about X-rays coming from the accretion disk around a supermassive black hole. High energy X-rays will come through, so you know that there is a supermassive black hole over there, and you'll be able to infer that. Okay, but let me get back to the so. Both, thank you both for your suggestions, which was which are in the right direction. But let us try and see what we can do in terms of mirrors in the sky. Okay. This is this is an this is NGC 1068, um, which has which is classified as a Cipher 2 galaxy. And one can ask oneself, Cipher 2 galaxy means only narrow lines, that are there broad lines in this galaxy? And you can see that if you take an ionization cone, you will actually see quite a prominent ionization cone over here. There's a radio jet coming out in roughly the same direction and very high energy, uh, very high frequency observations actually give you a structure orthogonal to it. And there is speculation that this may be from the torus itself, okay, which would be orthogonal to the jet axis. Now, if I want to try and get, infer um, that where there is indeed a reflector in the sky, what would I do? So this was a very interesting experiment which was done by Miller and Ski and Tanucci and others. And what it did was they took a spectrum away from the nuclear region to look for broad lines. Okay. And they did find evidence of it, but you could uh, you could then ask yourself, is it reflected light or is there some other reason that this that this uh, broad lines that you're seeing, which are not in the nucleus but off nuclear? You all know from your basic physics that reflection of electromagnetic radiation can give rise to polarized light, polarization of the emission. And they did find that this broad emission lines, which was off nuclear, give rise to, gave rise to broad polarized emission lines. So normally if you just take an intensity, which is a thermal process of an intensity, the lines would not be polarized unless there is a reflective component as well. So what it did show is that there is uh, broad lines which are getting reflected to the line of sight towards you. So giving rise to the belief that the Seifert 1 and Seifert 2 are similar kinds of objects. Okay, forget the 1.5 now. That if you got, here he is, what, he, what this cartoon is trying to show is that there is light which is being reflected light which originates over here, gets reflected by clouds of electrons or dust and comes towards you. It will be much weaker because it's reflected light, but the light should have the signature of being polarized. Okay? And, uh, and, and this actually gave rise to looking at galaxies where geometry plays an important role in what you see. The geometry means the orientation relative to the line of sight towards you. So the galaxy is oriented in a way that, uh, that you get a view of the direct nucleus. You see it as a Seifert 1. Whereas if it is oriented in a way that you see it along the torus, you will see it as a Seifert 2. So the orientation of a galaxy plays a dominant role in the way it appears to you. This, this whole field is referred to as the Unified Scheme for Active Galactic Nuclei and gave rise to what are called as active gal galaxies. Okay, uh, Active galaxies, Unified Scheme for Active Galaxies, so that the apparent diversity of active galactic nuclei may be lower than what you, what appears in the sky. So today we will uh, just summarize this uh, kind of galaxies we talked about, Seifert galaxies, radio galaxies, and quasars. Tomorrow, I will also talk a little bit about how unified schemes apply to radio galaxies and quasars. But these are the three kinds of active galaxies we talked about with jets. Uh, Seifert galaxies are usually associated with spiral galaxies. Radio galaxies with elliptical galaxies. Quasars can be both with elliptical and spirals. And although the ones which are luminous in the radio tend to be associated with elliptical galaxies. I should mention here that not all elliptical galaxies are luminous in the radio. Only a small fraction are highly luminous. And that is another sort of question which we are still trying to 
understand in some depth. So today, uh, uh, today we will close with that, but we will take a few questions, okay, before we close. And tomorrow we'll start off by looking at the velocities of the jets, because that has an important bearing on the way objects appear to us. And then we will take on to understand how some of the jets appear to be moving at superluminal velocities. So we'll understand a little bit more about jets. And then we will look at why black holes are important. Why is it important? And why is it uh, that one invokes supermassive black holes to understand the jet physics as well as the energetics of these uh, highly luminous radio galaxies and quasars. So now we can take a few questions and then we will close today. Okay. Um, none as how to explain it, but just uh, some objects not in others. What exactly triggers the jets? Okay. So let me take each of these questions one by one. Okay. Um, so you can you can actually post your questions to everybody rather than to just me, so that everybody is aware of the question. Okay, uh, Anudeep has asked if the torus is made of dust, can we use IR instead of X-rays to observe the object inside? See, see what happens is that uh, uh, that, that that's been done for some time to try and use infrared emission to look at. Uh, uh, unification schemes and the central regions of active galactic nuclei. And the torus uh, consists of, uh, uh, would, uh, in, the, in the inner regions of the torus, it could be ionized. But as you go further away, it will co consist of molecules and dust, and dust will emit at infrared wavelengths. So emission from dust has been attempted to try and use, uh, to study the unified schemes. Um, but, but, uh, but what happens also at infrared emission in the central regions of galaxies, you have the bulge. And the bulge also has a lot of old stars. And some of these old stars will also contribute to the infrared region of the spectrum. So it is, it is a bit of a challenge to try and disentangle the different effects. Um, so in terms of studying the accretion disk itself, uh, it is often done in the X-ray region or the black hole. And the jets is often done in the uh, X-ray and radio region of the spectrum. But when looking at the jets, we do try to look at it across the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, right from radio to X-rays or gamma rays, as you saw in the case of the M87 jet. But there are challenges in trying to uh, study the torus uh, in the infrared, but uh, but it has been done and it's being made. It's been done, but, uh, but you have to be careful of stellar contributions as well. Okay. Uh, is it all right, Anandip, or you wanted to ask something more? Nankumar has asked how to explain unified schemes, jets, some objects, and not in others. What triggers the jets? Okay. Uh, okay. So the thing is that as far as the triggering of jets is concerned, okay, uh, triggering of jets is concerned, what is it that triggers a radio jet is something we do not completely understand. Okay. Uh, so what we are trying to understand in the unified scheme, for example, whether it be Seifert's galaxies or radio galaxies and quasars, is to understand uh, how geometry and relativistic motion of jets that we have not touched upon today, but we'll touch upon it tomorrow, uh, can be used to understand the apparent diversity of active galactic nuclei. The question is, uh, is that whether some sources uh, have jets all the time, um, or some sources are never able to form jets, and what are the physical conditions that are required to form jets? Uh, we'll discuss some of it tomorrow. And does it depend, for example, on the mass of the supermassive black hole? Does it depend on the spin of the black hole? Does it, is it a combination of both? Or in addition to that, do we require uh, gas to be there or, or, or for the black hole to accrete to be able to generate? So these are some of the interesting questions. Um, no clear answers are there but we'll discuss some of these aspects tomorrow, okay? Okay, we can take one or two more questions. You must be a little hungry as well. It's getting close to one o'clock. No? And then we'll close today. And uh, I, would, I would like you to be more interactive than you have been today, but you've been not too bad. Uh, so, 
The thing is that if you're interactive and ask questions, then others also pick up and I also can explain things a bit better. Uh, so do come prepared with, uh, with black holes and jets tomorrow with all your questions. And uh, we will try and round up this discussion on astrophysical jets and supermassive black holes tomorrow. And if you have any questions, you can also email it or put it in the Moodle platform. And uh, I'll try and address that tomorrow.